Okay. The chapter entitled Save to Serve in the book Ministry of Healing is the chapter that we're going to consider. We were to prepare this chapter and then by way of review, we're going to dig into God's word today. So let's take a look. Page number 95 in my book, chapter entitled Saved to Serve. Now we know what this chapter implies. Saved to serve, right? Being drawn from the world. Saved from what? Saved to serve. Saved from what? Saved from sin. All right. And once you are saved from sin, serve whom? To serve God and to serve others. See, love the Lord, Lord thy God and even your neighbor as yourselves. Saved from sin to be sent forth by God to serve Jesus and to serve others. Amen. Let's take a look at a scripture here. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. Go to Matthew 20 with me. Matthew chapter 20. One of my often quoted scriptures, Matthew 20. Saved in order to serve. Matthew 20. And God's word says in verse number 27, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be what? Ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And as God the Father sent Christ, even so he sends us. Let's turn there. Save to serve, page 95 the sixth chapter in the book, Ministry of Healing. Now, this chapter goes through different accounts in Scripture showing how God rescued people from sin and brought them forth and sent them forth as missionaries. Who was the first account brought forward in this chapter? Save to serve. Who? What now? The demoniac. All right. That's it. The first one, demoniac. It's interesting as you go through this account, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew says that there were two demoniacs. Mark says one demoniac. Luke only mentions one demoniac. Let's take a look at that. Let's see if we can reconcile that. All right? Let's go now to the book of, let's go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Let's start there. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. The first thing we must consider here, all right? Two authors mention one demoniac and the other mentions two demoniacs. In Luke chapter 8, are we there, my friends? All right. Look with me here at verse number, verse number 27. Together. And when he went forth to land, there met him... Out of the city, a certain what? Man, singular. A certain man which had devils. And it goes on. Only one. Let's take a look at Mark's account. Go to Mark chapter 5 with me. Where are we going to? Mark chapter 5. And let's take a look here at verse number, verse number 2. Mark 5 and verse 2. Are we there? It says, And when he was come out of the ship, Immediately, there met him out of the tombs. A what? A man, singular, with an unclean spirit. Both authors mention a man. Look at Matthew's account. Matthew chapter, where are we going to? All right. Matthew chapter 8. And look here in Matthew 8. And look, look now at verse number 28. Matthew 8, verse 28. It says this. And when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him how many? Two, possessed with devils. So notice now, how is it Matthew mentions two demoniacs? And yet we have Mark and Luke mentioning only one demoniac. How do you reconcile that? What now? They were too busy while they were running. 
come on. One, maybe one was more aggressive. So let me ask you a question. Who was right? Was Matthew correct? Two demoniacs? Or was he wrong? It was really one demoniac because Mark and Luke both say one demoniac. Who was right? Who was right? You mean this error in the Bible? Who was right? They're both they're all, all right. Yes. The perspective of the writer. Let me ask you a question. How many sides do you see if I hold this book up? Only one side you see, right? This one? Okay. I can see two sides. The top and the back right here. So, depends on perspective. There were two demoniacs, but both Mark and Luke only wrote off one. If I identify the one, you understand what the other one looked like. Two demoniacs. And we shall see that as we go forward. Now, take your book, Ministry of Healing. You know what? Let me take it one step further. Do you know that there is an account in Scripture that mentions the blind man that Christ restored his sight. The blind man. Do you know? Luke and Mark both say it was one blind man. Blind Bartimaeus. But Matthew says that there were two blind men. Look at that. Yes. Go to Luke 18 with me. Luke chapter 18. Where are we going to, friends? Luke 18. Oh, yes. Luke chapter 18. And look here. Again, and those three texts we read earlier, the one in Luke 8, the one in Mark 5 and Matthew 8, if you read the surrounding verses that preceded and that followed, you, sh you will see it's the same account all the writers are dealing with. Look at Luke 18. And notice now in verse number 37 and verse number 38. Well, go back to verse 35. Luke 18, 35. And it came to pass, are we there? That as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain what? Blind man, singular, sat by the wayside begging. And if you notice, if you notice, verse 39, he said, Thou son of David, have what? Mercy on me. Look at Mark's account. Go to Mark chapter 10 with me. Mark chapter 10. And notice again, Mark 10. Look at verse number 46 of Mark 10. It says this. Are we there in Mark 10? All right. Verse 46, it says this. And they came to where? The same place as in Luke 18, 35. They came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side. What now? Begging in verse number 48, thou son of David have what? Mercy on me. Mark and Luke says one blind man. Look at Matthew 20 now. Matthew chapter 20. Look at verse number 30. Matthew 20. And look at verse number 30. Matthew 20. Look at verse, well, go, Matthew 20. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 shows you it's the same account. Are we there in verse 29? Where are they now? What place are they now? Jericho, same place, Jericho, verse 30. And behold, how many now? Two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that who was passing by? Have mercy on us, Lord, thou son of... And verse 31, the last phrase, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Do you see it now, friends? So Mark and Luke mention only one blind man, but Matthew says how many? Two. Two blind men. Again, who was right? Who was wrong? They're both right, my friends. Perspectives. And understand this, that Matthew was a chief disciple. All right? Now, the historians say, let me get my bearings right, that Mark got his information from Peter. All right? And also, Luke got his from Paul. All right? But Matthew is a chief disciple. Did Christ call him specifically? Yes, he did. All right, go back with me to the book of, you know what? Go to Mark 5 with me. Mark chapter 5. Perspectives. 
You know, friends, notice, if you have a group, if you have a group and they all look the same way, act the same way, if you identify one, what is the implication? You are identifying all in that group. There was no need to mention what both look like because they all look the same. So Mark and Luke dealt with how many? One demoniac. Now watch this carefully. Notice, what I saw was that Matthew's account was very brief. You know what, let's, let's take a look at that. Hold Mark chapter 5, right? Are you there? Go back to Matthew with me. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 8. Go back there with me. Matthew 8. And here's the point. Matthew 8 is the, is the, the shortest account of Christ healing the demoniacs from Gadara. Amen? It was the shortest account. Look at this. Matthew 8. Are we there? If you look at verse number 28, the account begins in verse 28 and ends in what verse? Verse 34. A very short account. Hold your place in Matthew. Go to Mark 5 now. In Mark chapter 5, look at this. The account of Christ's healing, this demoniac, begins in verse 1. Are we there in verse 1? Now, where does the account end? The account ends in verse number 20, 21. Yes, you're there, 21 verses. Then they move over to the other side. Do you see that? Look at this, close Mark. Well, yes, close Mark. Look at Luke, go to Luke chapter eight. Just comparing here, Luke chapter eight. And notice now, in Luke eight, the account of Christ's healing, this demoniac begins actually in verse 26. And ends in what verse? Verse 40. Verse 40, verse 40, verse 40. Do you see it now? So Matthew's account is the shortest. But notice, it's the most potent. Why would I say so? You're close. As you said, it gives more details, but in a short uh, uh, space. No, Matthew doesn't give as much detail as Mark and Luke. You're very close though. So even though Matthew's account was very short, why do I say his was uh, the most powerful? What now? He was there, okay. He was more specific. Okay, think about it. I want you, you to answer it. M Mark and Luke mention only one demoniac being healed. Matthew says two were healed. So which is more powerful? That's it. Not one, healing two. Two witnesses. So which account was more potent in this sense? Matthew's account. Two were healed. Amen? Amen, friends? All right. Look with me now. Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Are we saying one author is better than the other? Not saying that. Look at Mark chapter 5. Perspectives, my friends. You know, and this, this must humble us as Bible workers and as preachers. Because all of us think that as preachers, we have to emphasize every minute detail as do other preachers. No, so. Not so, friends. Do you know John also write about Christ's life? John. And John doesn't mention anything about Christ healing a demoniac. So... Was he preaching present truth? <laughs> you see what I'm saying now, friends? So as we have to make sure that we emphasize somebody got healing. Somebody got healing. Power is available, right? And some intricate details you may not mention. That doesn't mean you're not preaching truth. Or oh, you'll miss that. I mean, you'll get that. Go to Mark chapter 5 with me. Mark chapter 5. I wonder, I wonder if someone had said, but wait a minute, Mark, Luke, you're in error because you didn't mention a second demoniac. Not so, my. Oh, or John, what about when Christ healed the demoniac? You're not preaching all the truth. This must humble us. All right? Perspectives. Get to the point. Amen. Mark chapter 5. Are we there, my friends? Let's notice now. The description of this demoniac. If you describe one, you describe both. Look at verse number two with me. And I want you to write down each point 
of his description. Because remember now, the chapter is entitled, Save to what? Serve. When we look at this demoniac, if he was so far gone in sin, how could Christ use such a one to serve him, Jesus, and to serve others? Since Christ did so, there's hope for me. Saved to serve. All right. Because I know Christ keeps, the devil keeps many people in a bind. You have done too many evil things. Christ can never use you. Saved to serve. Think not, I'm come to call the righteous. No. I'm come to call sinners to what? Repentance. And then he says now, uh, then he says now that uh, new wine must be put in new bottles. So who would be the new bottles then? The sinners that repent. They now can carry the new wine. You all missed that. All right. Amen. You're sleeping on me today. You sure? All right. Mark chapter 5. Look at verse 2 with me. Ready, friends? And by the way, that was Matthew 9. I just quoted. Matthew 9, verse 13. Verse, verse, verse 13 down through verse number 17. Amen. All right. Look at this. So there's hope for us. That's the point. Hope for us. Look at verse 2. You know what? Let me say it this way. Do you know Christ never called any of his disciples because they were ready to be used? Look at Peter. I mean, would you have called Peter to be your follower? Wait a minute. Would you have called James and John? I mean, would you? I mean, they would get you incarcerated. Quickly, by association. So Christ called them to fit them. Make sense, my friends? Hope. He called them to fit them. Hope for us, my friends. Save to what? Serve. Verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with a what now? Unclean. Okay, so note that. So what did he have? Write that down on your paper. Unclean spirit. Number three, who had his dwelling among the tombs. So where was he dwelling? Among tombs. Again, write those down. I'm going to call for them later on. And no man could bind him. No, not with chains. What does that mean? He could not be tamed. No man was able to help him. It's right there in verse 4, the last phrase. Verse 4 says, neither could any man what? tame him. So no man was able to deliver him from these demons. No man could tame him. Put that down. Verse 4, the next description, verse 4, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. What does that mean? What now? Strong, all right, all right. what else? Breaking everything. Again, no man could tame him. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. And always, watch carefully, verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying. Put that down. Where was he? Night and day? So what was he doing night and day? He was crying night and day. Put that down on your paper, friends. Don't read over this. Night and day, he was in the mountains crying. Night and day in the mountains crying. All right. I'm going to call for this later on. All right. Look at verse number five again. And cutting himself with stones. Harming himself. Harming himself. Cutting himself with stones. All right now. Okay. All right. Let's pause right there. Let's pause right there. Let's go. What's the first one on your paper now? Had an unclean spirit. Question. What brings an unclean spirit in man? Sin. What now, Eric? Demons. Unclean spirits. Don't forget that. I'm going to come back to that. Very important point. Let me, let me hold that point for now. What's number two? Living among the tombs. Wait a minute. What do you put in tombs? 
dead, the dead, the dead. Now, watch carefully. So where did he love to dwell? In the cemetery? <laughs> Among the dead. What now? Sp he, he was spiritually dead. He loved spiritualism. He was among the dead. Watch carefully now. How would you apply this spiritually? Living among the tombs, living among the dead. Spiritually. Huh? The world. All right. So he loved the world. What else? He loved darkness. What else? Yes. What now? Staying away from the truth. Exactly. And also being around others who are spiritually dead. Two demoniacs, my friends. Two demoniacs. They flock together. You know what I saw here? Do you know that there is a group of people? Pause. Such a person living among the tombs, Christ was able to clean up and use. Have you ever seen some people in the community? Downtown Orlando, I drive, International Drive downtown. And they bore every part of the body. And wear these things in their ears, in their nose, in their tongues. All right. And they tattoo this and, and they tattoo their heads and tattoo their chest and everything, friends. The gothic lifestyle. Right. And they wear these skull and bones. And many times we look at those people and we say, those people. Hmm. I was reminded that, that this person, these two men, lived among the tombs. They loved skulls and bones. So can Christ even reach some people who are now a part of secret societies? Clean them up and use them? Hmm. Oh yes, oh yes, friend. So don't cast off people when we see them. If you had seen me before God, re before I realized God was calling me, you would, you'd pass me by on the street too. You would think there's no hope for me. So don't just look at people and write them off. They lived among what? The tombs. And God was able to use such a person. Isn't God good, friends? All right. Tombs, all right. Have you ever seen some clothes they wear? And they wear the chains and the, 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 the shackles, the spikes, the spikes, black nails and the black nail polish, that is, black nail polish, black nails, black nail polish and black boots and what else? And the colorful here. And we say, those people. And some of you run from them too. Just as we're going to see later on. But if God could have cleaned up such men, God can do it for them. He can do it for us. What do you say? All right, move on. What's the next thing on your paper? Could not be tamed. What does that mean? Others were trying to bring them back to, the, back to sanity, but they could not break that spell of demon upon them. Uncontrollable. Uh, superhuman strength from demons, untamed, chains. You know, friends, I dug deeper into that because the margin says they could not be bound with fetters and also with chains and cords. Do you know the Bible speaks about binding the sacrifice with cords to the altar? Notice now that when the sacrifices were also brought, they were to be bound to the altar of sacrifice. In other words, everything people tried to get these two men to surrender, live a surrendered life, they brought those chains and came off the altar of sacrifice. We will not surrender. They brought the chains, brought the fetters. What else on your paper, my friends? What? Oh, that's key right there. What now? They were crying night and day in the mountains. And what else? Okay. What does it mean they were crying night and day? Hmm? Because this is linked to the next verse. Crying night and day. 
they were, they were crying out for deliverance. That's it. They were in category two. They understood their sinful nature living among the tombs, but they could not find deliverance. And they're crying night and day in the mountains, longing for deliverance. And that's why, look at verse 6, and when he saw who now? Jesus. Afar off, what happened? He ran and worshipped him. What was he doing before in verse 5? Night and day he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying for deliverance. That means there are some people who look so far gone. They paint 666 in their head. And you say, those people, deep down, when lights are off, when the friends are gone, when they're by themselves in the mountains, in the secret places, they're crying to God for deliverance. And some don't even know who God is. Just crying out. <laughs> Amen. It's not a microwave prayer. They're weeping night and day, my friends. Night and day for what? Deliverance. And that's why when he or they saw Christ, they what now? Ran to him, worship him, seeking what? Deliverance, my friends. Amen. And God was able to clean up such people, two men. And Mark says, uh, let me address one. You know, it's like when Christ, oh, let me move on. Look at Luke. Anything else? Yes. On the paper? On the paper. Okay. And what now? And cutting himself with stone. What does that mean? Literally. Me harming himself, suicidal, self-mutilation, self-abuse. I mean, think about it, friends. I mean, today you have people who don't use stones to cut themselves, but they use a needle. And I won't go too deep on that point. We've got some young ears among us. They use needles to hurt themselves. No? Yes, yeah, and even cut them. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if you remember a few months ago here in Florida, they found some men who were taking some pill, some pharmaceutical drug poison, and it gave them some hallucination and they were freaking out and they were crying and literally cutting themselves. And they found one by the 408 under the bridge right there and running out naked to attack people. You have forgotten. I think it's called, the drug was called, uh, I forgot the name of it. What now? Bath salt. Bath, bath, bath salt? Yes. Google it. They were cutting themselves. Modern day with knives and razor blades. The demons, as a matter of fact, a, a few years back, when I was doing some social work in the community, in New York there, and there were some people who were on meth, meth amphetamine, meth. And uh, one of the person who got victory over it, he said when he took, oh boy, I don't want to get too descriptive now. But he would feel things crawling under his skin. And he would cut the skin trying to get the thing to come out. So now this man could be a person on meth. You're not here, man. Yes, yes, yes. And if God could clean up such a person. Oh, my friends. God can do for others today. And for many of us. Can you imagine, friends? Save to serve somebody on meth. And you know, I mean, when I saw him first, his teeth were falling out. I mean, when somebody is on meth, the teeth um, disfigured, um, decayed, and one by one, they begin to fall out. They get wrinkles, they, they premature aging, hair start falling out. And he even showed me a before and after picture. Within two years, you would not believe it's the same person. But praise God for deliverance, my friend. People are on meth and crack cocaine and heroin, you name it, my friends. 
I mean, this, this, this lesson, safe to serve, means so much to me. Such a person, God was able to clean up. And he was crying night and day in the mountains. Nobody couldn't find help. That's why we have to go forward now to help these people. But we can't go forward if we ourselves, if we ourselves are in the tombs, if we ourselves have an unclean spirit, if we ourselves are hooked on similar things as they are hooked on. Can't work. Let me tell you something. I hear some of you say, I want to be a medical missionary. Are you, would you scorn somebody on meth? I mean, would you scorn somebody on heroin? Let me tell you something. People who are on these street, hard street drugs, they don't practice proper hygiene either. They have a, a very strong odor. And strong is in quotes. Strong odor, friends. And you have to go down and meet and rub shoulder, hold a hand with these people with love, without scorn, and see them through the eyes of Jesus. Amen. And remember Mark chapter 5, if Christ could do that for this person, I want to be Christ's hand, Christ's feet, to reach this person for Jesus. Amen. You don't see them as they are now, but what they will be in Christ. Amen. That's how we got to see people, friends. If not, we are useless as a medical missionary. I mean, we can learn all the treatments, but without love for souls, mean you nothing. Sounding brass, tinkling cymbals. All right. Let's go to Luke's account now. Look at Luke's account. Let's close Mark. Go to Luke 8. Let's see how Luke describes him, which means describing them. Luke chapter 8. Are we there in Luke 8, my friends? All right, look with me carefully here. Luke chapter 8, and let's take a look at verse number 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Look at verse 27 now as Luke describes this man. It says, are we there? Yes. It says, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city, a certain man which had devils how long? Long time. Let's read on. And, and wear no clothes. Put that down. Devils, long time. Put it down. Devils, long time. All right. What's number two? Number, wear no clothes. Hmm. Do you remember those men who were on bath salts running around naked? Downtown Orlando and even in California? Wearing no clothes. You know, I mean, God is so good. I pulled up this morning before I walked in the church, right? And there was somebody just walked off the street, and the person I heard, pong, pong, pong. I said, What is that? This person out of nowhere had a slingshot. Back in, back in Jamaica, we call it bingy. <laughs> a slingshot. A crooked stick, a stick, a Y stick with a rubber. He put a stone inside there, two strings, stone, right? Yes. He was taking the stone in the slingshot and firing it on the dumpsters outside there. And my vehicle is parked right there. I'm like, what is happening here? What if he misses and hit my vehicle? And the thought came back to me, never mind. You're going to be talking about that later on. I mean, Christian got fearful. Where is he? Christian, back there. Got fearful. Even Hillary. Amen. I said, never mind. Never mind. And I walked out and I walked right up as close to him as possible. Opened the trunk. Let him know there's no fear right here. And he kept on walking. Kept on walking. You see, friends, you're going to meet folks like that. Wearing no clothes. <laughs> Are you ready to minister to these folks? Let's move on. Are we there? All right. It says, and wear no clothes, neither abode in what? In any house, but in where? In the tombs. Next point. He abode in no house. Okay, let's start there. What's number one on the paper? Don't forget that. An unclean spirit. Okay, devil's long time from the book of Mark, book of Luke, 
and Mark says unclean spirit. Number two, he wore no clothes. I won't spend much time on that. Now, what is clothes a symbol of in scripture? Righteousness. So he was empty, void. Amen. Amen. He had no character of Christ. Wore no clothes. What else, my friends? But neither abode in any house. What is a house a symbol of? Church. 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 He, was, he was homeless. Homeless, friends. You know, um, years ago, uh, um, and even a few months back, we were doing homeless ministry. I love homeless ministry, friends. I love homeless ministry. And uh, we were there in New York. Just came back from Oakwood. No, probably my first or second year. Came back from Oakwood, went to my church there, Mamrie. Or he said, because mm, you know where I'm going now. Because he was there way back then. And we gathered all the young people in the church. Now, let me tell you something. Every Sunday morning at 5 o'clock, 5 a.m., we would leave our homes and come to the church and meet there at 5 a.m. I came from Queens, some came from Long Island, all over, came right there at the church. And we would begin with song service, worship, prayer, and then we begin to pack the bags. Apples and bananas and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, all right? Pack all the bags, and pack the bags, and put, put those sandwiches in our knapsack, in our backpack. Then we prayed, and by 6.15, we're out the door of the church on the bus from Avenue H, Utica, all the way to Eastern Parkway to catch the subway. And while on the bus, we're singing and we're preaching on the bus and passing our tracts. Got to the subway, got down there, off on the train, and while we're there, we are singing, we're ministering, passing our tract right into Manhattan. And Manhattan is filled with homeless people. Yes. And we just descend on Manhattan. And we're walking, I mean, we walk from, let's say, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to noon. Just passing out food and sharing literature. And what I realized, most people who we met who were homeless, they, they are well-educated. They had much resources. And something just happened. Just, just something happened. And they slipped. They slid. And they found themselves homeless. And also helpless oh my friends and we talk with them it wasn't as I call it drive by or walk by here's a bag no 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 and they could tell who was sincere because those folks who only came around Thanksgiving time they would not take your food because where were you the other times of the of the year but once they saw us coming they knew who we were they would line up to get their food and as we, as we talk to them and we give them tracts and Bible studies, you would see people's faces were, were even changed. My mother is here, and even Chanel, they were back then. There were about three of them who came from Manhattan, received Bible studies, got baptized in the church. Amen. Homeless people. Ministered to them off the streets. This means a lot to me. I would never forget when the young people began to hear about what was happening at Mamre, and they would leave their churches and began coming to Mamre just to be a part of the ministry. Just to be a part of, of the ministry. I mean, you couldn't find a place to park or to even sit in church. Young people willing to work. I believe uh, we were about to close that mission in New York there. I would never forget the last Sunday. Where's Chanel? Were you there the last Sunday? I mean, we not cried, we bawled. I mean, I mean tears just rolled down faces. Crying until, you know, mucus falling out nostrils. <laughs> just the overwhelming feeling to know it's the last time we'll be able to do this. That's it. I mean, and I always told them, remember this. These people who are homeless, we're only one step away from this. Only one step away. Only one, only one, uh, only one decision, that's it, away from becoming homeless. 
lonely and helpless. And I said to them, remember this, if we stand for the truth, when the mark of the beast is in force, every one of us will be homeless. Now, we won't be as like these people here in that sense, because again, we won't be in the cities, right? But one day we will all be homeless, my friends. Is that point clear? One day, all of us will be homeless, but not being helpless and alone. It's a difference. I mean, I mean, that was ministry. I mean, friends, you know, so, so we moved down to Florida, went to the church up here in Claremont and began the same ministry again. Young people on fire for the Lord. So what stops that from doing it right now? I believe we had started this downtown Orlando and then the city passed an ordinance just as we began stating that you should not feed the homeless. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right. And then that, that had stopped the mission there that we began when we came to Florida. But friends, saving, save to what? Serve. You're going to win souls that way. Um, there was one, one gentleman who got baptized. Every time we saw him, he would sing a song. Remember it? He came from, he came from where? He came from? He came from heaven to earth. All right. Forget about that. Back to the scriptures. Luke, amen. Luke chapter 8. Let's forget about that. Where are we going to now? Luke 8. Friends, we are saved to do what? Serve. Ministry has to be our life. Everything must be about ministry. And I'm thinking about doing something similar here. Because, friends, if we're not ministering, we're dying. Uh, we're dying, friends. We're dying. And if you want to get the church energized, do practical ministry for God. Not only running around, but doing it based on what God's word says and sheer truth. Sheer truth. You'll see souls come to Jesus. Sheer truth. If they don't come now, guess what? They'll come in at God's appointed time. In Luke chapter 8, look now at verse number 28. What happened once Christ met them? Look at verse 28. What happens now? It says, and when he saw whom? Jesus. He cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with? Did he cry out? What was he crying out for? Deliverance. Did he want deliverance? Now, something I had to ask God. These men weren't just demoniacs. They were mad men. As a matter of fact, go to page number 96 in your book. Where are we going to? Page 96 in your book. All right. Now notice here. Pardon me, pardon me. Page 95. The first paragraph. The first paragraph. So we have Matthew who said two men were demoniacs. Mark and Luke both say one because they address one. Look at the first paragraph. How many demoniacs did Sister White say were there? Two mad men. All right. Okay, notice here, friends, notice here. I asked God the question, how could these madmen know that you were a, that Christ was able to heal them? How? How? Something must have been going on that they saw or heard to run to Christ, fall down to worship, asking for deliverance. What do you think it was? Come on. Faith, but, but, but faith comes by something, by hearing. Hearing what? You're giving me intangibles now. Give me what, what now? Uh, what, but it's not there in the account, in the back. What happened for them to have strong faith, Christ could heal them? Come on. Yeah, but how, how did they hear about him? Right here, right here, right here. You're close. Yes. Character, you're close. Friends, what happened that very night before the morning? They were, okay, two things, two things, two things, two things, two things. Number one, they were in the actual region 
of the, that great storm that night. They were there. Watch this now. So they must have heard the disciples speaking about it when they came ashore. How could he, friends, question, if water is in your boat and your boat is sinking, you are about to die, you wake up Christ and he says, peace be still. And the seas and the waves and the winds obey his voice. Your life is preserved. How long would you talk about that? What? How long would you talk about that, friends? So they must have heard the disciples saying, thank you, Jesus. We made it to shore. The demoniac said, wait a minute. This man can calm the seas, the winds, and when they saw him, they ran to him. If you can do that, we are coming to you for help. That's what they heard. The testimonies of whom? The disciples. Because when they were cleansed, what did Christ send them to do? Go and what? Testify. That's it, friends. What has Christ done for you? Watch carefully. Look at Luke chapter 8 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Did everyone catch that? Okay, what did I just say a while ago? What increased your faith? What caused them to believe Christ could heal them? The disciples' testimonies. That's it, friends. Look at Luke chapter 8. I believe that with all my heart. Luke chapter 8. It just makes sense. Are we there, my friends, in Luke 8? Watch. Look at verse 22. Together what it says. Now it came to pass on a what? Certain day when he went into a ship. With whom? Watch carefully. And he said unto them, let us go over unto where? So who told them to go over? Who told them to get in that ship and go out at sea? Christ said that. Did Christ know a storm was coming that night? Does he know the end from the beginning? Did he know that? Was he testing their faith? And how did they respond in that storm? Do you see why he said now in, in verse number, verse 25? And he said unto them, where is your faith? And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water and they obey him. If Christ is leading and storms come, why lose faith? So that means when we murmur and complain, when we lose faith, we don't believe he's leading. Because he told them, let's go. If he's in the ship, if you know his presence is here with you, what are you doubting? Why are you murmuring? Why are you fearful? That means the disciples were fearful twice in this account. What happened when they saw the madman approaching? Were they fearful? I want to ask a question. Did Christ give them evidences not to be fearful? Okay. Give me some. Come on, in the back, hands up. He just calmed the seas. Do you remember a few weeks ago I gave you seven things that Christ does to increase our faith? If you don't get these seven, you're not going to heaven. All right. Number one. I won't put you on. Well, okay, let's go. Number one, his word. Number two, what? Oh, wonderful. What he has done in the lives of others, he can do for you. Number three, what he has promised in his word to do for you personally. Number four, what he has done in nature. If he can calm the storm, can he do it for you, my friends? Believe it. If mad men could have their faith increase. How much more we who claim to be sane? How much more should we who claim to be sane? What's number five? I'm not going to let you off the hook. What's number five? What now? His death on Calvary's cross for us is to increase our faith. Number six. His work. 
Oh, in the sanctuary, specifically, most holy place. And number seven is second advent with the reward. Since a reward is coming, we can hold on. We can have faith that reward is coming. So did this encourage you right now, my friends? So why did those disciples run away? Since Christ showed them, I can calm the storm. What now? Weak faith, but was there something else? Did they realize these men were demon-possessed? Yes. Did Christ heal any person who were possessed previously? Yes. Look at Matthew's account. Go to Matthew 8 with me. You know, friends, sometimes we wonder how on earth could these disciples have such weak faith, being so fearful, look at all the evidence, yet we do the same today. When God gives us so many evidences, Save to serve. All right. Where are we going to? Are we there? All right. What's in verse 16? When, come on, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And what now? He cast them out with his what? Word. What did Christ use to calm the sea? Word. Look at this now. Are we in Matthew 8? Yes. You sure? Okay. What is in verse number 24? Do you see it now? The tempest in the sea. All right. What's in verse 26? Why are you fearful? Oh, you have little faith. And then comes what verses? 28 through 34. Why run away? When I've shown you. My word can expel demons. Why run? Why be fearful? Go back to Luke 8 with me now. All right. Do you remember what number one, the first description was for the demoniac? Demoniacs? Give me Mark's account. Mark says what? Number one. Mark. Unclean. Okay. Please, friends, watch this carefully. Unclean spirits. All right. And what was number, number one for Luke? Devils. Devils, long time. If Christ could do this for people who were in sin for a long time, clean them up and use them, how much more can he do for us? But watch carefully. Look at Luke, number, Luke chapter 8 with me. Watch carefully. Luke 8. Are we there, my friends? Look here at, at verse 29. It says this, verse 29. For he had what? For he had commanded. No, no, no. Pause right there. Pause right there. Go back to verse 28. Together. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said what now? Do you see a contradiction there? What is a contradiction? He fell down to worship, yet saying what? Oh, listen to me now. That means he, on one hand, he was willing to worship, to surrender. But when he opened his mouth, his expressions, his words were filled with demonic forces. A great, a war between the flesh and the spirit. The man in the temple in Luke 4. Let us alone. Now, I see an application here. There are people who come to church to worship. Finish it. There are people who come to church on the Sabbath to worship. But when they open their mouth, demoniacs, their expression, their mannerisms show they are unconverted. But that doesn't mean that they are trying. True. True. What happens is, the minute we hear someone say something, wear something, act a certain way, we write them off quickly. And then we call ourselves medical missionaries. No. By your actions, you are running away. Amen. He was willing to worship. People come willing to be taught, to be delivered. 
The church is a hospital, a sanitarium for the sick. But those who lead out must be under shepherds of the great physician to impart the antidote to the poison of sin, the grace of Jesus Christ. Make sense now, friends? Did Christ remove the demon? Look at verse 29 now. Here's where we're going now. It says, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains in fetters, and he break the bands, and was driven of the devil. Where? Into where? Look at verse 30 now. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Wait a minute. What's our topic here, my friends? Save to serve. How could Christ use somebody who had lesions? One author said a lesion in the military had a commander who oversaw at least 3,000 to 5,000 uh, soldiers. Unclean spirit, lesions. Let's go one step at a time. One step at a time here. One step at a time here. How did so many unclean spirits enter this man? How? You have to catch how. They, they didn't hear you. He left the house unclean. He left the house empty, swept, and garnished. And that demon that was once cast out, oh, are you seeing it now? He brought seven more demons, more wicked than himself, to occupy that house. And the end of that man is worse than if you have seven multiplied by seven. Do you see how we get the lesions now? Let's go. And four to nine multiplied by seven. What is that? Oh boy, no mathematician. And that multiplied by seven. What is that? Legions, amen. <laughs> Hold your place in Luke 8. Go with me. Matthew 12. Where are we going to, my friends? Because I want to walk this down. How did so many demons enter this man? I mean, give me the math there. At least, give me four to nine. Seven, seven nines. Six to three. All right, seven fours. Twenty-eight. Plus six, what is that? Three, four, three. All right. By seven again. Seven, three is 21. <laughs> what is that now? Plus or times seven again. <laughs> we are lesions. That's serious, right, my friend? Serious. That means this person was in and out of Christ. That's the only way lesions enter. Unclean spirit. In and that was why when he heard, he remembered, he ran and fell at his feet. I want deliverance. Look at this. Matthew 12, my friends. Matthew 12. I love this chapter. Verse 43. Are we there, friends? Are we there? What it says here, together. When the unclean spirit is what now? Gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and find none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he finds it how? Empty, swept, and garnished. Verse 45, then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and what now? Occupy there. And the last state of that man is worse than what? 
the first, yet, yet was he delivered. That's the hope. That's the hope. He was still delivered. Long time been this way. You know, friends, a text says in Romans, Romans 5, that where sin abounds, the leaven, amen, the true leaven, grace much more abounds. That's hope. I mean, this must encourage us because many of us have done some wicked things in our lives to embarrass ourselves, embarrass our family members, embarrass Jesus. And yet, the devil is saying, no, you can't be used by God. But God is saying there's hope for you today. What do you say? Yeah. Have to be cleansed. Come to him. Legion. All right, go back with me. Luke chapter 8. Go back there with me. You know, friends, there's something here I don't want anyone to miss. I don't want anyone, anyone to miss. All right. I want to pull you in as I'm fishing for souls today. Look at verse 30. What else in verse 30 grabbed your attention? What now, Jeremy? What is thy name? Who always asks, what's your name? What is your name? Why would he ask, what is your name? Who else in the Bible was asked, what is your name? By God, Jacob. Jacob, what is thy name? Jacob, thy name. Shall no more. From this day, thy name shall no more be called what? And what does Jacob mean? A supplanter, a thief. And my grandmother always say lying is next to what? Stealing. If you're a thief, you're a liar. <laughs> and if you break one of God's Ten Commandments, you are guilty of offending, breaking all. What is your name? I'm a commandment breaker. What is your name? That means Christ pulled out of him surrender, confession. Amen. Oh, you missed that. Amen. It may sound as if on one side it was just a demon speaking, right? On the surface, it looks that way. But when he said, my name is Legion, what was he saying on the other side of the coin? I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm a sinner. Not only one sin, I've committed 3,000 sins. Legion. 5,000 sins. Was he naming his sins as it were? Legion. In other words, like Paul, he was saying, Christ came to save what? Sinners of whom? Of whom? I, Paul, am Chief, chief of sinners though I be. Oh, don't let me start singing now. I can't sing. Oh, yes. I am legions. He surrendered. And that's the key, my friends. That's the key. What is your name? Did Christ change the name of Jacob? Yes. Was his character changed? Yes. yes, my friends. So what is God asking us right now? What is your name? And did he bow down? Yes, he did, my friends. Let's, let's read on. What happened next now in verse number 33 onward to verse number 37? Where did Christ send those demons? And that's why we don't eat swine, right? So because devils were put in the swines, that is why we don't eat pork, right? One of them. All right. Someone says, if I eat pork, I'll become like the devil. <laughs> All right. So why did Christ send the, dev the, the demons into the swine? <laughs> so an unclean spirit was placed into an unclean animal for consumption. So just as the unclean spirit should not be retained. Consumed and retained. Do you see it now? Likewise, the pork, the swine, make sense now, should not be consumed. 
the unclean spirit into an unclean thing. Does it make sense now, friends? All right. Let's move on. Not saying that's why God says don't eat pork. Don't eat the pig because what? It is unclean unto you. Leviticus chapter 11. Let's move on. And how did the people now react? But wait a minute. Now, when did they become angry? Before they saw the men being made sane by God? Or after? When? Imagine, they came and saw the men who were once uh, insane, demoniacs, cleansed in their sound mind and still were angry. Okay, friends, we know the surface application, but what is another application? <laughs> so they were demon possessed too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Any other applications? Talk to me. What now? What now? They were more concerned about themselves, their livelihood, than souls being delivered. Souls being what? Delivered. How do we apply that today? Yes. To, to care for the poor, the homeless, and the mentally ill, but in reality... It's all about money. So many people claim to, to care for the poor, the homeless, the pauperers, the mentally challenged, but it's all about the money. The money. You know, friends, people may see uh, folks getting delivered from various drugs and sins. And before they rejoice in God, they are now questioning the method by which it came. You missed that. You missed that. They were angry with the method by which it came. We were losing something in the process. Oh, you missed that. The, oh, they did not want to make a sacrifice. Angry with the process. Okay, you want to heal them, but don't touch our pigs. <laughs> the process. And so it is today. People are being delivered from sin, but many folks get caught up in theological ramblings. What church do you attend? What conference are you with? What now? The process. What now? They can't hear you. Talk up. They've seen the baptism here, and then they, they're upset by that. So they are upset with the baptism. Yes, 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 yes. So they are unclean too? Look at this. Now, this point is crucial. Let me skip those points. This point is crucial. What did the men say to Christ now who were now healed? Here is Christ leaving now. He's walking. He's walking. What did they do? They ran behind, Lord, Master, we want to what now? We want to follow you. All right. What did they learn? What were they trying to achieve? Think about this now. What brought the legions in the first place of demons? In and out. Come on. The back and forth. Come on. Say more. What brought the legions of unclean spirits? Matthew 12. Come on. Say it. Come on. Say it. The what now? The house was empty, swept, and what? Garnished. So they understood what must be done to keep the experience. We can't allow him to leave now. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Because they were now about to give a testimony. And Christ is setting things up now. They knew the demons came because they kept the mind empty. And that's why I always emphasize, even if you can't physically sit down and read the Bible, play the hymns. Play those scripture songs. Never you allow the mind to be empty. Never, don't do it. Do not do it. Do not do it. What now? Idle hands, the devil's playground. Don't allow the mind ever be empty. Keep those songs playing. If you, if you can't find songs, hymns, play some scripture songs. You can't find any, play the hymns just with the, the uh, instrumentals. Do not allow the mind to be empty, friends. 
So they said, Lord, we can't allow you to leave now. But he said, watch. He said, I want you now to return and do something. What did he say now? Watch carefully. Watch carefully. Go to your house and do what now? And go and tell what I've done for you. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Lord, make sense right here. They said, Lord, don't leave. We understood what brought the lesions. Our minds were always empty. So we came to church. We were focused. But once we left, the mind was empty of spiritual things. Now we understand what it is to keep the experience. Lord, don't leave us, Lord. But he said now, all right, go and tell what I've done for you. Think about this. If you go and you are reciting and replaying and rehearsing and speaking what God has done for you, what's happening? So did he actually leave them? <laughs> His works was constantly in their minds what he had done for them. I said, praise God, I see it. And so now, not until we are engaged in aggressive evangelism, not until we do this, the house will be filled. If we don't keep sharing what God has done for us, witnessing the house, the mind will be empty, swept, and what? Garnished. And how many more demons come? Legions, my friends. All right. Hold your place in Luke 8. Are those points clear? You sure? All right. Go to Mark chapter 5 with me. Mark 5. Don't leave, Lord. We know what it takes to keep the experience. You know what? We won't finish safe to serve today. I may have to do part two. We won't finish this. I must cut in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes. All right? All right. Where are we going to? Mark 5. Don't leave us, Lord. We know what it takes, what, it, what we must do to keep the experience. We don't want to go back into the tombs, right? Into the mountains where they're willing now to walk away from the mountains, the tombs, from cutting themselves, right? Where they're willing now not to go back there. You're not hearing me, my friends. Stay with us. We want to follow you now. We don't want to go back there. What were they doing? Go back to your sheet now. What were they doing previously? They had demons. What else? In the tombs. In the air. Mountains. What else? Crying nights and day. Feeling hopeless. What else now? Cutting themselves. Okay, what else? Naked. No clothes. Lord, we don't want to go back there. Ah, oh, friend. That's genuine repentance. But now he says, okay, I got the best antidote. Go and tell your experience. As you share, you won't go back there. Ah. You know, friends, I know something. The more I talk about my victories, is the more I'm determined not, oh, 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 not to go back into that sin or else I can't share that testimony. Oh, friend. Did you catch that? Yes. yes. So I want, to, I want to maintain the victory in Christ so I can keep on sharing it. Because when you go back into sin, that testimony is nullified. Empty. It's weak. You're lying. If you want to keep the experience now, he says, go and tell. Go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead. Where are we going to Mark 5? I'm going to close and come back and pick Pick this up some other time. Yes. It also says on page 100 in the ministry of healing that it's for our own benefit to keep every gift of God afresh in our memory. May I read it? Means May I read it? All right. Let's turn there. Page 100. For the camera. Page 100. They can't hear you. Page 100. Okay. Paragraph 3. Paragraph 3. All right. It's, it, it is for our own benefit. Are you there? It says this, it is for our own benefit to keep every gift of God, how? Fresh in our memory. By this means, faith is strengthened to claim and to receive what? More and more. So the more you talk about what God has done for you, you are saying, dear God, do more for me. Amen. Oh, do you see it, my friends? All right, read on. There is greater encouragement for us 
is the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we can read off the faith and experience of others. So yes, what God has done for others may bless you, but what is a greater blessing? What you know he has done for you personally. That's a greater blessing. Because when you meet somebody in a similar state as you are or as you were, they want to hear what God has done for you. Not John Brown or Mary Smith only. It says, the soul, let's read on, the soul that responds to what? The grace of God shall be like a watered garden. His health shall spring forth speedily. His light shall rise in obscurity, and the glory of the Lord shall be All right. seen upon him. Mark 5, go there, Mark 5. Mark 5, and look at verse number 18. Are you being blessed with this, my friends? Amen. Yeah, you are? Okay, that means I can stay a little longer. No, I'm going to close shortly. Verse 19, are we there? Verse 19, ready? How be it, come on together, how be it, Jesus, suffered him not, Ah, oh, friends, but saith unto him, go home to thy friends. And what now? Underscore this. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So no, notice now. I'm going to give you a quiz. Could you hold your place in Mark 5, please? And go to Luke 8. And let's see what's the difference in these two instructions. If there is a difference, Mark chapter 5, and the verse is verse 19, and go to Luke chapter 8, and tell me what slight apparent difference in the instruction you see. Luke chapter 8, are we there now? All right, look at verse number uh, 38, all right? All right, he wanted Christ to be with him, and Christ sent him away saying, are we there now? Verse 39, together now. What does Christ say now, friends? He says, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. All right. What's the difference there? What now? Okay, you see compassion. Anything else? Friend's house. To testify that Christ is God? Come on, compare them. What now? Tell your friends. Really slowly. Come on, what do you see there? Okay. What now? Come on, talk to me. Don't be afraid. Marco. Huh? Ah, brother. You got it. So one says tell and one says go show. What's the is there a difference? What difference? One says go tell, and the other says go show. What's the difference? All right. Okay. All right. So some people, okay, anybody else? Show. Show yourself as a living testimony. Anybody else? Tell, show. Come on. Show. Okay. Say more. Tell, show. Uh huh. All right. Is there a marked difference, though? Come on, you're you're all correct. Is there a marked difference? All right. All right. All right. So some can take the verbal and accept. Others need to be shown. All right. To continue living it. I mean, you're all correct. Uh, I'm not saying anybody's wrong now. Yes. Susie. Example. Okay. Can somebody give a testimony about God's goodness and yet in the life they are bearing fruit? Yes. Oh, what God has done for me. And then in the life, the actions are contrary to the verbal testimony. Yes. So what you say, go and what now? Live. Go tell and show. Yes. Well, that's what you, you can be a saint outside with your 
All right, so, so, so he sees now Christ sent him to two groups. Your home and what now? Your friends. Why? Why the different places? Come on, make the application. Come on. I mean, we all live on this earth. Come on, right? Yes. Why home and, why home and friends? All you can do to your friends is telling them. Right. Sure, all right. But it's, it's both also. Yes, in the back. All right. Now, now, do some people live a certain way at home? But when they go among friends, it's a different way of living. You're like, it's the same person? So wherever you go, do you see it now? Live the life of a victor over sin. In your home, I think a hymn goes that way. Um, a hymn, in the home and in the throng. Be like, ah, oh, you know it. Amen. You've got to play the songs. And they come to you. Well, let's sing it. I can't sing. Go ahead. Just a chorus. Be like Jesus. I would. Amen. Do you see now, friends? In the home and in the where? Where's the throng? Outside. Be like home. Jesus. And what happened? Let's close. Luke 8. Let's close right here. Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke 8. Are we there, my friends? In Luke 8? What happened when Christ returned? Did the man go forward? Look at verse 38. Now the man, out of whom the devils were, were departed, besought him. That he might be with him, but Christ sent him forward, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way, and did what? And published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Christ was returned, what happened now, friends? Oh, my Lord. The people gladly receive whom? Jesus. For they were all what now? Waiting for him. Now, do you know why I also believe it were two? There were two madmen. He sent them as a what? Witness. And he sends them how? how? Two by two. And they went to the whole city. Now, what did the city see that caused them to say, we are waiting for Jesus? So what is the world waiting on? What is Orlando City waiting on? New York City. Los Angeles City. They want to see the change in us. Then they're going to believe. All right. All right. Let's close right here. How many accounts was brought up in the chapter? Who were saved and went forth to serve? Who else? Give me one more. In the chapter, the woman at the well. Did she receive an experience? I'm breezing over this. Did she receive an experience? Did she meet Christ? How long did she spend with Jesus? How long, friends? Two days? A week, right? A year. Three and a half years. Not even a day, my friends. Not even a day. But what she received, she went where? To the city. And what happened, my friends? She, she told a whole city, come, come see a man. And what happened, friends? And when they came, they said, we believe. But not, not because you said it, only. But we have seen, we have heard, we have felt for ourselves. And what did they say to Christ? Don't leave. When every time people meet Jesus, they say, don't leave. Tarry here with us two days. Because they knew to keep this experience, Christ must tarry with us. Now, save to what? Serve. What was she saved from? How many husbands did she have? Mm -hmm. And if Christ could have used such a woman, my friends, 
who saw her need, who surrendered, can Christ use us? If we see our need, if we surrender. Isn't that beautiful, my friends? But we have to come to him. What is your name? He's asking. What is your name? I want to ask you a question. Is there anyone here who doesn't have a testimony? You don't have a testimony of victory. Raise your hand. Unless you are a baby, everyone here does have a what? A testimony. And if you don't have one, get one, my friends. Amen? Get one. Let's close with this text. Chapter 12 of Revelation. Go there with me. Where are we going to? And we know it. Testimony. What has God done for you? What has God done for you? What has God done for you? Look at verse number 10 with me. All right. I want somebody here to find Psalm 51. Okay. Who will find Psalm 51? Raise your hand. Okay. Cameron, Psalm 51. I want someone to find Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Rosamond, Psalm 40. Okay. And then we're going to close on those three texts. Okay. Let us read chapter 12 first of Revelation. We close right here. Okay. Are we there? Okay, let's go. Verse number, verse number, uh, verse number 10. Are we there in verse 10? Skip on down to verse 11 together. And they what? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Do you see it now? How will victory come? They overcame him by the, by the blood of the lamb. That's life, right? And what else? By the word of their testimony testimony and they love not their lives even unto what death that's it friends once you receive that life the blood the life of the flesh is in the blood then you can give a testimony okay let's take uh, let's take psalm psalm 51 first cameron do you have that let's all go there psalm 51 psalm 51 you know friends even though we did not go paragraph by paragraph, I want everyone to go back and read the chapter, Save to Serve. Please read, read that chapter, friends. All right? And reflect upon the last quotes on page number 104 through 106. Those quotes, if you read them, you don't need anyone to urge you on to do ministry. You will not need anyone to persuade you. It will come naturally. When you read those chapters, those paragraphs, rather, paragraphs 104, 106, closing this chapter, save to serve, you will not need somebody else to persuade you to go and witness. You won't need that. And if you still need that, your heart is tough. Hmm. Needs to be broken up. Okay, Cameron, Psalm 51, are you there? All right, look at verse number 10. A testimony, verse 10 through verse 13. Go ahead, preacher, loud and clear for us. Verse, verse 10. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So what did he ask for? To create in him a what now? Clean heart. Verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take wow. Thy Holy from me. And that was what the demoniacs asked. I want your presence. And the men in John 4 that the woman, the woman called to come see Jesus, they also said, don't take away your presence. That must be our call today to God. Okay, verse number 12, preacher. Cameron, verse 12. Okay, everyone now together, verse 13. Then will I what? Teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be what? Converted unto thee. Your testimony. Okay. Rosemont, Psalm 40. We close. Where are we going to? Psalm 40. Your testimony, my friend. Your, your testimony. Your testimony. <laughs> verse number, verse number eight. And I covered this in prayer meeting. But anyway, verse eight. Sister, go ahead. Okay, friends. What now? I what now? I delight to do what? Thy will. Dear God, what does the word delight mean? To find joy, love, pleasure. Dear God, give me that delight. And what will happen now in verse 9? Everyone together. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. 
Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, and thou knowest it. Verse 10, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. What do you say, my friends? Amen. Amen. Did this chapter bless you? Amen. Did it bless you? Okay. My brother here wants verse 1 and verse 2. Psalm 40. Go ahead, read verse 1 for us. Okay, everyone together. Verse 1. I waited how? Patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Verse 2. He brought me up also out of what? An horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. No, 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 no. He said verse 2. I'm going to add now. Verse 3. Ah, verse 3. And he hath put a what now? A new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You see, the more you have the songs being played, spiritual songs, the hymns, scripture songs, he will increase your trust, increase your faith. And here it is now. When you meet people who are sick mentally, sick physically, sick spiritually, and they need increase of faith, what have you done to be where you are? Give your testimony. And what are you doing to maintain? Amen? Maintenance. What you are doing to maintain that experience. This is what the world wants, a witness. Will you be that witness? By God's grace, amen? Okay, I hope those online were also blessed. Let's all pray, let's all kneel. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word. Saved to serve. This is a living experience that we must have daily. If we are going to carry forward the true ministry of healing. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this inspiration. The sun has set. A new day has begun. Help us to go forward now. Chronicling the victories you have given to us and asking you for wisdom, the right words. Give us the right time to share them in the right manner, the right way to encourage others, that souls will be prepared to receive you when you come. Not only must we give people the written word, the audible word, but they need a witness to go along with that word. And your word says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. A witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Make us your witnesses, saved to serve. And save us, we pray. We thank you for hearing us and answering. We pray also for those who join us online. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.